and we're doing that uh, one because we have an English guest, and it's good Dutch habit to uh, to speak English for our guests. Uh, and there are some other English guests. That's the one you guess this. Can I just see by a show of hands who's here uh, in the institution from outside of the institution? Okay. Especially a warm welcome to you. We're really happy to have you. Um, today we open up our tennis cafe, our knowledge cafe, which is a regular thing that we do just to keep each other in the loop and up to speed about all the awesomeness that we're, we're doing in the institution. Um, so it's normally an internal meeting, but we've opened it up because we have a special speaker, Eric, that I'll, who, will, uh, who I'll introduce in a, in a few minutes. Um, and because we have a, a really uh, special topic, uh, for us at least as an institution, uh, perhaps you've seen it somewhere in a newspaper or uh, heard it somewhere that uh, over the last week we collected our first few games by a, a game company called Radarsoft, which is a very Dutch game company that I will tell a little bit more about later. And um, it's really exciting for us because we're an audiovisual institution um, who realizes that we're in a ch part of a changing landscape. I mean, changing, it's been going on for about 30 years. We're talking about the 80s, we're talking about Radarsoft. And, um, and, and an institution that's really keen to keep uh, being up to date and also become the archive of the future that uh, can present new audiences with uh, game cultural heritage. Um, and um, so, so over the next year, um, I'll be doing research into this area of game preservation. How do we do this? What are solutions that are already available? What needs to be developed? And um, this is a new field for us, so building bridges with the industry, because we all need each other here. Um, so already yesterday, Eric spoke at a meeting of us um, you know, where we had a, a number of uh, stakeholders in game preservation in the Netherlands together uh, to, to figure out a way how can we you know, do this together and cooperate more. Um, so Eric was very, um, uh, his talk was very insightful, so I'm looking forward to this talk today. So without further ado, I want to introduce him. Um, Eric Holtman. He uh, works as a researcher for the um, uh, University of California in Santa Cruz, but has been involved with game preservation for much longer, about eight years, I think it was. He yeah. uh, used to work at Stanford University, where they have a huge collection of software and games. Um, so uh, really looking forward to hearing from him. Um, just a little note up front, we're quite a diverse audience, um, so I think there will be some parts that might be challenging for some, simple for others, but I think over the whole, you will find that there is enough for each and every one of us. And after Eric has um, uh, shared with us his thoughts on game preservation and the challenges that uh, we face, uh, Bob and I will show you uh, some, I call it snapshots, from Dutch game history, uh, which will hopefully help us to you know, become excited about this project. So, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, okay, let's get this done. Um, I just want to thank everyone for... Uh, there. Um, I'd like to thank everyone at the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision um, for having me here. Uh, it's been really great to talk um, with colleagues, especially internationally, on this issue. Um, doing work in the United States, generally we only talk about the game culture in the United States because that's where we have our focus, so I'm always really interested to find out about everything else going on in Europe and Japan with you know relations to digital game archiving and game history. Um, on that note, hi, I'm Eric. Um, I study computer science at the Expressive Intelligence Studio at the University of California at Santa Cruz, um, which is primarily a game AI research group, but we branch out as is obvious that I'm here. Um, I do a lot of work in the technical history of games um, from an engineering perspective um, and a social history perspective. Um, and as was just mentioned, I have done work as a game archivist for Stanford University, which kind of prompted this whole talk. Um, my talk today is again going to be in three parts. Uh, first, I'm just going to mention what I talk about when I'm talking about digital games. Um, there'll be some presentation of the digital games landscape, um, and then specific preservation issues for games and game media. Um, then a discussion of what's been done to preserve them um, based on projects that I've been involved in um, and projects that we're currently working on. Um, and then that's the third talk. It's essentially the work that I'm doing right now um, and thoughts on the future of this preservation issue. Okay, so for games, um, the specific type of games that I'm talking about are organizations of digital information that someone, usually the creator, call the game, um, and that generally represents a software object. Um, the reason that I let the person define what a game is is because the 
this area is incredibly varied. Um, you have a history of games starting with Space War in 1962 on a PDP-1 computer, um, you know, with a very CRT simple display. Um, actually, it's, yeah. And you end up with games like this, which is Detroit from um, the studio Quantic Dream coming out this year, which is approaching photorealism. Um, and we talk about this object and this object in the same breath, and there's a lot of difference. <laughs> Um, technically and, you know, um, all sorts of professional ways that they're incredibly different objects. Um, and then games themselves are actually becoming, you know, a huge cultural phenomenon. You have billion dollar franchises built up around sports um, and, you know, our nice iconic Mario. You have billion dollar independent games now, like Minecraft, um, which is another thing that's apparently destroying the youth in this, <laughs> at least in the United States. Um, and then you have a burgeoning indie scene where games are starting to deal with other issues like losing your child to cancer or gender transition or, you know, depression. Um, and then pulling out of that space, you also have large multi-scale virtual worlds that people interact with, all the games you're playing on your phones, um, and apparently within the next year or so, you'll be essentially convinced that you want to strap this onto your head and enjoy whatever that gentleman's enjoying. Um, <laughs> Um, then there's also alternate reality games that like kind of turn experienced and lived locations into games, and then esports, in which games like League of, League of Legends now have the same viewership numbers as professional physical sports. Um, and all of these will have specific preservation and technical concerns that are very divergent. Um, for what I'm going to be talking about today, um, it's essentially very limited um, based on the experiences that we've already had. Um, so, the types of games that I'm going to be talking about in the preservation activities is essentially when you have a unit of, a solitary unit of game information or data that is put onto a storage medium, in this case a Nintendo Entertainment System cartridge, and then loaded into a singular hardware device. Um, this device is then usually connected to a display, so you can see what's going on, and inputs, that, so you can kind of interact with it. Um, and this is kind of just a generic caricature of the types of preservation activity that we've been exploring. Um, so, essentially the three main components here are executable and assets. When I say executable, essentially a software program. A set of instructions that a computer can execute um, and then turn into an interactive experience. Um, this information is put on some form of storage media and then conveyed to a platform so that you can experience it. Um, the first little components that I'm going to talk about versus preservation issues are mainly concerned with the physical hardware issues. Um, you have, with storage media and platforms, kind of very specific issues dealing with hardware and, soft hardware and storage media obsolescence, um, bit rot and degradation, compatibility and hardware specificity, and then data migration. Um, with obsolescence, uh, all of the media game formats and the specific consoles that we've dealt with you know, have very short shelves lives intentionally due to capitalist and commercial processes. So you have five to 10 year window when a specific system or group of systems will be very popular and then they will wane. Um, in addition to that, all of the storage media that this, that, you know, is holding the game data is subject to conditions of degradation, which is commonly known as bit rot, um, in which data will slowly become corrupted over time or lost altogether if it's not migrated off. Uh, then, again, with storage media issues, there's compatibility. Um, you have a platform and it has a specific type of media that it takes. Um, and this seems simple initially, you have like a Game Boy and it has a Game Boy cartridge. Um, but then you start progressing through the, you know, media tree of Game Boys and you realize that things are backward compatible, they look different, they only play specific types of things, and this kind of goes on and on. Um, this is also a truncated tree, like there actually are more variations here. I just couldn't fit them all on the slide. Um, my favorite is that Nintendo now calls the new Nintendo 3DS is the name of the system in the US. So like the new classifier is actually very, very related to what is compatible with the system, and it just makes everything even more confusing. Um, so when you're talking about compatibility, you have to decide what you know works across which of these like horizontals of compatibility, and then which specific configurations of hardware are actually the same. Um, which is just another level of expertise that is needed to actually preserve and deal with these objects. Okay, so now with just some overview of 
specific physical hardware issues. You have the whole issue of actually getting the games to run. Um, now, when you have a, a group of game data like an executable and the assets it needs to you know, do its deal, um, you're dependent on the organization of computational systems. Um, in this case, when I talk about a game platform, like I showed the Nintendo Entertainment System before, um, it is a specific organization of levels of abstraction from the essential electrical hardware components all the way up to the running game. Um, and so there's usually many different levels. This is a very simplified picture. But from the perspective of any game or executable, this stuff is actually not that important as long as you're communicating with the program in a way that it understands. I'm going to add this big asterisk that in other contexts is incredibly important, which we'll get to. But from the perspective of the game running itself, um, as long as you have some program interacting with an interface that it understands and it can communicate with, you can generally get it to run. And this is due to the nature of computational devices in that one computer can actually imitate the processes of another. It just depends on how um, much extra work you need one computer to do that. Um, so in this case, if you want to run a game or game data um, on a platform for which it was not designed, you need some sort of mediating interface between the host platform and the original platform. Um, so if I want to run a game for the Nintendo Entertainment System on this laptop, um, there needs to be some sort of interface that lets me read the data from the Nintendo cartridge, communicate that data to the host, have the host do the processing in its own computer language, and then send that information back to the executable game. Um, and then this interface is commonly referred to either as an emulator or as a virtual machine. Um, there are very distinct and important technical differences between these types of things, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to get into them. Um, virtual machines that people generally have interacted with, just on the slide, have been either VMware or Parallels. If you want to try and run a Windows operating system on your Macintosh computer, you are basically installing a virtual machine that is running the Windows operating system and translating that to a form that your Mac can understand. Um, so again, you have this executable group of data, or the game, you wrap it in some interface, and you install it on another machine that can run it. So is our problem solved? Like We can run games from Nintendo on my laptop without too much of a problem. Um, well, yes and no. This is kind of be the only way I answer questions in this entire talk, probably. Um, is that when you start dealing with running a original game through an interface to a new system, to a new platform, um, you have specific limitations with emulation, software versioning, network access, digital rights management, and play experience that come in. Um, now, if we remember back to this diagram I just showed you, um, there's a lot of extra work being taken up by the host platform to decode the instructions from the original game, translate it into a language that the host understands, and then translate it back through the interface. And as a result of this, when you're encouraging, when you're dealing with emulation, um, accuracy is usually a trade-off for speed. And so if your emulation is more accurate, it uses a lot more computational resources to make sure that all of the specific um, vagaries and complexities of the original host platform are actually reflected um, in the you know, running emulation. And just a salient example of this, um, which is kind of funny, there's a Speedy Gonzales game for the Super Nintendo in which you have to hit a button to make a block fall. And for some reason, whoever programmed this game made that button click to activate that block highly dependent on the timing between two chips inside the Super Nintendo. Um, and most emulators ignore that timing difference because no one uses it for actual real reasons. Like in a game, it would be kind of, you know, it's just odd from a there for Dell perspective. But so as a result of that, only the VSNES emulator can run this game correctly, and it occupies a multi-core 3 gigahertz processor to do this. So you're emulating a 25-year-old system, and you're basically using the computational resources of a modern laptop to get speedy to use that block. Um, now, whether or not that's important to you is a whole other discussion, but this is just kind of an issue in that emulation <coughs> accuracy is important for running large classes of software, um, and there will be always itch cases that kind of trigger um, difficulties. Another thing is, if you say you're going to run a game, for instance, Doom, which is a seminal first-person shooter, which is all you know, violent and that stuff, um, the notion is when you say I'm going to run Doom or store Doom, which Doom are you talking about? 
Um, this is a truncated version tree for the original Doom on the left that came from one of our projects. Um, and this only gets more complex with modern games. Lots of games now have a tradition of either being updated on the sly or automatically on your phone. And so when you're talking about a specific game, if you're not considering the version, it's very hard to know what context you're supposed to run it in, what it'll actually work on, what systems it'll work with, that type of thing. Um, another shortcoming of emulation is the fact that you have to have access to the whole system to emulate it. Um, so for a lot of games that depend on communicating with a you know, virtual world server or some other proprietary software that's out there in the cloud, if you can't emulate that and you can only emulate the program installed on your local machine, you don't, you don't really have the game, you don't have anything in that way. Um, and then again, even if you could emulate the entire world um, and all the users, you don't have all the people who are playing it, which made it a compelling experience in the first place. So at this point, emulation won't really solve that issue. Um, if you have games that are highly community-based, you can't just reproduce them in the future and expect to have the experience back. Um, digital rights management is also a kind of a big concern, um, especially with emulation. The first of which is that all the emulation work that's kind of been done is technically illegal, um, at least in the United States. Um, and so people are kind of intentionally just skirting the law to create systems that let you reproduce these and preserve these objects, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to. But in addition to that, um, there's certain aspects of physical DRM authentication and online distribution that get in the way. Now when I talk about physical digital rights management, I mean here I am running the game civilization in an emulator, and I'm playing it, having fun, and then I get asked to answer a question based on specific pages from the instruction manual that were included with the physical packaging of the game in 1990. Mm -hmm. And I'm stopped. Now, for civilization, it's really popular, so I just download a PDF of the manual and literally go to that page and answer my questions. Um, but there's a lot of games that employ this type of technique in the 80s and early 90s, and so you kind of need the packaging or need reproductions of the decoders and the packaging to even get the game accessible. Um, another big issue is authentication. Um, certain games today require online authentication to just play them, even if they're not an online game. And so when the authentication servers are down, the systems are designed to not be playable. Um, and so as a result, when the authentication servers actually go away just due to negligence or corporate destruction or whatever, these things are going to be rendered unusable unless you actually use cracks from the legal community to rerun the games in the future. Um, and then this whole issue, with I have to skirt because I have an entire talk, um, is all of the online distribution that we're using today for our online apps and our mobile apps and even on the Mac with the App Store um, is aimed at convenience for the user to not have to manage the application themselves. And as a result, are absolutely disastrous for any preservation efforts. You download an application for your phone, you don't have really access to it as a discrete object. If you want to get it off of your phone in any way that would be preservable, you need to jailbreak your phone and download it off you know, in some sort of illegal way. Um, and there's really no actual version tracking that is retrievable through these systems. You can't decide that you want an old, broken version of a phone app, even if it's significant, because Apple doesn't want you to have an old, broken version of a phone app on your phone. Um, and that's all I'm going to leave that there, because it's just a lot. Um, the last thing is just play experience. If you're playing a game on an emulator on your laptop, it is not, you know, like this. It is not this experience. Um, there's also a lot of interesting issues in that the specific technical affordances of, like, television displays or the actual hardware were used by programmers to exploit, you know, visual cues. So here is just an example of, on the left is a CRT display of this Atari game, and on the right is a modern LCD display. And if you notice, the Atari programmers on the left intentionally made the wheels in this checkerboard pattern because when you play it on a CRT, they're low resolution and fuzzy, so it kind of blends together into a gray wheel. Whereas if you play it on a modern emulated screen, it just looks like these weird bugs that are going around. Um, and another issue is that the Atari actually ran at 60 frames per second. It was pretty precise due to all sorts of vagaries of the, all sorts of specifics of the system. And so even if you watch like video replay that's at the wrong refresh rate playing back, it'll make the games look much worse than they actually played when you played them in, like, you know, at the time. Okay. Um, so that's just an issue of some of the issues dealing with a specific subclass of games that I have experienced with. Um, for a whole spiel, you, you know, will be writing books and talking about this for years. Um, okay, so what has been done, at least in the United States, to preserve this? Um, 
we have large collections. Um, Stanford University, where I used to do a lot of the archival work, um, has a significant amount of collections due to its proximity to Silicon Valley and its tech friendliness and the like. Um, there's the Apple Computer Archives are there, the Stephen Cabernetti collection, which I'll talk about more in a second. Um, we have papers from some seminal game designers like Steve Bretsky, who was at the company Infocom, which is a popular adventure game series from the adventure game company um, from the late 80s to early 90s. Uh, and then Hal Barward, who did some work at LucasArts. Uh, the University of Texas, Austin, has a pretty large collection. I don't have very specifics about their collections, though. I'm just informed that it's large. Um, and then there's the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York, um, which has the collected papers of Will Wright, who made SimCity and The Sims, and John Romero, who designed Doom. Um, and the Strong Museum of Play is actually the largest collection of toys and games, I think, in the world. Um, and they have a, one of the largest uh, electronics collections that I'm, I've encountered. Um, I just have this video here, which does not have sound, because I think people who are talking in it would not want to be heard. Um, but this is just one section of their collection, um, which was the most extensive that I know of for like contemporary uh, in the US. <laughs> and I kind of like this video because it just keeps showing things. Um, they also have a kind of a kinship with here, at least the, the stuff I've seen stored here for the physical objects. They have a ton of toys and games that are stored in their actual archive, which we'll see in a second, that just keeps going. Um, but it's nice to know that at least someone in the US has a significantly large collection and all the NESs and that. Um, the collection I'm most familiar with is the Stephen M. Cabernetti Collection in the History of Microcomputing at Stanford University, um, which actually has 15,000 pieces of software, most of which are games, and around 400 pieces of computer hardware, um, which compromises about 1,400 linear feet. Um, most of it is in boxes, archival boxes like this. This is a bunch of Atari 2600 and 5200 cartridges, um, and is stored in the Stanford Auxiliary Library in Livermore, California, with the other four million or so items that they have there. Um, there's a lot of issues even with just throwing games in boxes and storing them here. Um, a lot of the hardware didn't fit in this facility at all, so you have them building this giant storage facility and then ingesting immediately a collection that they can't put anywhere there. Um, so there's a lot of talk about how to solve that. Um, the Cabernetti collection also has a lot of in, like, nifty things just in game ephemera. Um, you know, you have things like the Nintendo serial system, um, which <laughs> is one of my favorite marketing times, and you could win a Game & Watch on the back, and he looks really happy there <laughs> with his braces. Um, and then you get this, this notion of like certain games from the 80s and specific things about topical events, so there's all this like happy Wall Street exuberance and games about market speculation, and then games about market crashes. Um, you know, and then some other ill-advised titles, which is a nuclear simulation at a place that eventually melted down. Um, which is, but there's this idea, there's this notion when you look through these old game collections that people have tried a lot of stuff subject-wise and gameplay-wise that we've kind of forgotten just because there's not a really good way to get back at it yet, um, or have it indexed. Okay. Um, another kind of aspect from the systems and collections in the Cabernet that, that is a very kind of historically significant for me is that you have the appearance of games like this game, Blood Money, by Psygnosis for the Amiga, um, and it's like a standard game that you just kind of fly sideways and shoot things. Um, and it was made by this company, DMA Design, which then used that technique to help their game Lemmings, which became significantly more popular, and then they leveraged that experience to making the first Grand Theft Auto. Um, and so there's this notion that you can kind of track the growing expertise and specific um, design practices of early companies just by having the old games around and seeing what they did with them. Um, it's also kind of nifty that you just find things. This is Formula One by Sid Meier, who made the Civilization series, um, and for Acorn Software. Uh, and I actually talked to him about this at one point, and he did not remember that he had made it until he saw the blog post, and he remembered, he's like, oh yeah, I did that in the early 80s. So you have this notion that we're actually saving stuff these people forgot they made, um, which I liked. Uh, and then you just have super silly examples, like communist mutants from space. <laughs> <laughs> which is just, it's like they're coming to give you socialized health care, I don't know. Um, or, or alien drug lords. <laughs> you got these like, no notions of like specific cultural things that were going on in like the mid-80s that people were afraid of for various reasons, and they get, you know, put out in specific games. Um, so this collection is actually the subject of a really important preservation project right now. 
Um, the Stanford NIST project. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US. And they have a the organization of data on that computer, whether or not you know, some specific thing is an office file or a you know, old computer game or what have you. So they can immediately decide that they don't have to look or investigate that data further. Um, and as a result of them finding out that Stanford had this massive collection of you know, late 70s to early 90s software, they realized they had a hole in this collection, so they developed this collaboration to do a full imaging and hashing of the entire software collection at Stanford. Um, so by the time this project's done, there'll be 15,000 images from everything in the collection that they could pull off. And then the next task, which we're kind of dealing with, is how to actually even manage that. Um, the process essentially is full photography for everything in the collection, and then using a variety of community developed extraction tools to get the data off of the magnetic media, or the cartridge media, or what have you. Um, there's a lot of patents that have expired on older systems, which allow people today to create, legally create, you know, another Super Nintendo that's a clone that you can then just slap all the data off of the cartridge for yourself. Um, there's also a lot of use of forensic recovery tools, like Forensic Toolkit, and this um, thing called the Cryoflux, which is essentially a really complex um, driver that lets you communicate with a lot of different floppy disk drives so that you can read all sorts of different media from, you know, the uh, The forensic recovery stuff is all scary looking and giant and maybe overbroad. Um, and the Cryoflux is also intimidating in its own way. It just has tons of different input devices for all sorts of different connections and, um, and computer drivers. Um, okay, and that's kind of the major imaging project that is going on in the US at this point. Um, Another major project is the Preserving Virtual Worlds 1 and 2 projects. Um, the Preserving Virtual Worlds final report from 2010 is still probably the most authoritative document um, on all the issues in game preservation that we encountered. Uh, and it's probably what people should consult if they want to go further. A lot of the issues I'm talking about in the first half of this talk came from our work through this report. Um, and this is kind of the swap of games that they looked at. Uh, the second Preserving Virtual Worlds project was on significant properties or archival significant properties for games and emulation. Um, and we basically realized that nothing, that we couldn't figure out a way to make that work um, after investigating it for like a year and a half. So there's gonna be some more investigation into how you actually compare an emulated game to an original game in a way that is useful for all the different user groups that might actually care. Um, another thing that's kind of happening in the emulation scene now is there's a lot of distributed emulation environments that are becoming available. Um, there's the Olive Executable Archive from Carnegie Mellon, which is essentially a way to download a virtual machine to your computer temporarily to run a game, and then when you're done with it, it gets checked back in. So it's kind of like a library for virtual machines. Um, there's the BWFLA Emulation as a Service project, which is similar to Olive um, in that it's running emulation for you in a distributed fashion. Um, but the notion here is that they're actually running the emulator on the cloud and then only sharing the produced video and the reaction to your inputs um, on your actual computer. So the data is never anywhere except for in the control of the institution that's using the system. The only thing that the user gets is just the images that are output from their inputs, um, in this case to a specific element on the browser. Um, the other largest emulation projects that there are are all fan motivated and community driven. Um, the main multiple arcade machine emulator and the multi emulator super system um, are probably the largest emulation project as far as video games are concerned. Um, MAME is now open sourced and then absorbed MESS, so the entire project is now called MAME. Um, it has support for thousands of systems um, and they get really specific. Uh, one of their my favorite new additions is emulation support for the Sonic the Hedgehog popcorn shop game, which you played to you paid to play it, and then you won popcorn. Um, and this machine existed for like a year and a half in Japan in the early '90s, and you can play it through this emulation system. Um, so these are the people who are kind of leading the front on this, and they're just doing it because of their own interest in preservation, just as a community. Um, okay, and then the nice thing about the emulators existing in this way is that there's a third approach um, that's been becoming more popular for emulation, uh, and that is taking our nested emulation thing, if you remember, it's the executable, the virtual interface, and then you know the host system, um, and essentially taking the emulator and then converting what was originally like C or a much more complex computer language 
um, into what's called an intermediate representation, which I'm not going to get into too much now. But the nice thing is that once you have this one translation, you can then output it as JavaScript, and it'll run in the same way that it ran when it was a native C application. Um, and the cool thing about this is then once it's JavaScript, you can actually just plop it in a browser, um, and it'll run. Um, this actual methodology is what's being used by the Internet Archive in the US for the Internet Arcade and their JSNS project. It's essentially a translation of the main emulator into JavaScript so that they can run games on the web page. Um, and if I have time at the end of this talk, we're doing a little bit of work with this, so I can kind of show you that interactively. Um, but that's the major stuff that's going on in emulation right now. Okay. So what am I working on right now? Um, well, I'm working on one area just as close to my heart as a person who does game design history and game history, which is there's essentially been no work done on how you appraise or deal with collections of game design development. Um, so I'll talk to that project a little bit, and then I'll get on to the current project that I'm managing, which is the metadata and citation project. Um, for the game development project, uh, we at the Expressive Intelligence Studio at Santa Cruz do a lot of work with um, interactive AI systems and interactive narrative systems to generate AI characters and artificial intelligence characters. Um, and one game that was made was Prom Week, which is a social simulation of American High School, which is, you know, plucked from 80s movies, which was kind of the motif we chose. Um, and this game was actually developed at our lab and then released and nominated for lots of independent game awards for technical excellence due to the, you know, artificial intelligence underpinning the system. Um, a funny side note on this is that the system underlying it was not actually, didn't need to be a high school simulation. So the next immediate project was a depart defense department um, project for soldier training for foreign interaction with native populations. Um, so this project immediately got co-opted into a defense project. Um, but regardless, it was a good test case because we had all the developers in the lab still there who had made the game. And so we kind of talked with them about all of the techniques they used for development and all the phases of development that they went through so we could kind of get in, I guess, an appraisal profile to figure out how to talk about the remnants of game design um, and network game design. Um, this kind of came out in a process caricature with the different types of things you do during game development, um, which is familiar to people who have done introductory game design courses and that the like. It's not much more advanced on that general progression of development. Um, and the model is kind of found in lots of game design textbooks. But the thing that we were noting is like what gets developed in each of these stages that you may want to care about or save. So you have you know, initial drawings and demonstrations. You have physical prototypes, which is essentially making a pre-digital version of the game to see if it's even fun, because otherwise you don't want to spend all the time to make a digital version of it. Um, and then all the digital prototyping that you need to do, in this case, to like tweak parameters of the artificial intelligence system and see if it you know, displays in a way that makes sense to the user. Um, principal development with all of the production that that incurs. And then you know, release and dissemination, which is PR material, and how it's distributed on the web and saved. Um, and we primarily focused on the born digital content here. Uh, and so we looked into you know, developers, what they put on the web and talked about as far as the game was concerned, all the stuff that was stored on their personal machines during the development. Um, all the stuff that was shared in their collaborative work environments, like Google Drive, Dropbox, and email. Um, and then also in version control, uh, which is a kind of piece of software that people who are developing other software use to manage changes in source code. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more uh, in a second. Um, the first thing that became apparent is that this is kind of a horrible thing to deal with. Um, this is just the file types that came from the Dropbox folder. Um, and the funny thing here is that a couple of them, specifically this Lel file, like we don't know what it is. Um, and this is a group of people who like I talk to most days and develop this thing, and I have no idea where that came from. Um, but the other notion here is that anything that you're developing in a like you know concept, anything you're developing technically, um, will produce tons of different files that were that were then dependent on all sorts of other software that also need preservation. So like this is 60 file types that require 30 other programs to actually run and you know, display in their specific ways. Um, and so it just kind of gets into this recursive loop of having to preserve software to preserve other software to preserve other software. Um, and another side note here with the emulators that I was talking about, those emulators also need to be preserved the same way that the games that they're running need to be preserved. Um, because if an emulator works really well on Windows, you need a way to convert it to work really well on whatever the next operating system is. Um, okay, another big issue, which 
I haven't seen much ever talked about is that everyone's storing all their stuff on Google Drive and Dropbox now, and these are not really archivally sound solutions, um, to say the least. Uh, Dropbox used to not care about file modification dates if you downloaded it to your local computer, so it just kind of erased all the modified histories of the files. That They changed that, though. Um, Google Drive is interesting in that anything that you put on your drive that you make on the web doesn't actually get stored on Google servers as a single file. When you download it, it gets kind of converted into whatever file you want at the time that you made it. Um, and Google will variously make updates to their interface and all sorts of other things that change the metadata associated with those files. And you can only get access to those if you're a developer with, you know, if, uh, with a, uh, access to their development API. And so there's a ton of stuff going on in cloud documentation that I haven't seen most people talk about at all. Um, and if anyone here has more thought on that, let me know, because we didn't really encounter much. Um, another interesting thing is version control. Uh, anyone who develops software, or most people who develop software, will use a system of version control to manage multiple people working on a complex programming project. Um, if you want to implement a feature or change something and don't want to destroy what everyone else has done, you will make your own little branch, as it's called, and then continue developing on that and then eventually merge it back into the main development tree to make sure that everything's okay and tests have fun. Um, now, the issue with version control is that it, again, like emulators and everything else, is also subject to the need to be preserved as an object. So if you have a copy of someone's version control server, you also need to make sure that whatever that version control server needs to run is also saved. Um, and so we kind of tried to address that a little bit in this project, but we didn't get too far. Um, there's just, you know, more questions end up getting generated any time we look into these things. Um, for this project, we put everything that we could find in the University of California's online repository, which was a full listing of all the emails, like 14 hours of development interviews, um, all the contents of the Dropbox and Google Drive folders, um, and then a bunch of different versions of the source control repository and the source code, just in hopes that we'd catch everything that we could. Um, there's no methodology that we were looking at for this because there hasn't been one developed yet, so this is kind of what we did. Um, I can share a link for that at the end of the talk. It's just up online if anyone feels like browsing. It's about seven gigabytes and 18,000 files. Um, I say that like flippantly, but it's actually kind of small for a development project. Mm -hmm. um, this got uh, put together into a white paper for the National Endowment for the Humanities um, called A Unified Approach to Preserving Cultural Software Objects in the Development Histories. I'll have a link for that also at the end of the talk. Um, it's the only document I know of that deals with the appraisal of game development and design documentation. Okay, and then the last project, um, which is the one I'm currently working on, the Game Metadata and Citation Project, or GameSIP, um, so we shortened it just because we had to find something. Um, this is kind of focused on dealing with uh, actual issues that are resulting from us having to ingest games at Stanford and University of California Santa Cruz and dealing with, you know, library staff and archival staff and technical staff and seeing what their issues were. Um, in that, in light of that, the project has produced cataloging recommendations for physical games and collections, um, some recommendations for descriptive metadata um, for games and collecting institutions, um, controlled vocabularies for platforms and formats. Um, I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, and then, essentially, a citation for software objects in a way that's relevant for scholarship and future recovery. If you want to talk about a piece of software as a scholar and you want someone else to find it, you need to do a lot more legwork than you would have to do for certain other textual citations. It's a very different thing. Um, so I'm going to actually kind of complicate the talk a little bit more, as it's not complicated enough. Um, in that control vocabularies for platforms, we had to kind of figure out a way to give canonical names to, to video game platforms so that we put them on a list. And if you remember this layer kick that I had before, which has you know, a bunch of different abstraction layers, um, we essentially found that when you talk about a computer platform, you're referring to some collection of these layers, but not all of them um, most of the time. So for instance, for earlier consoles and home computer systems, they were essentially just a collection of physical hardware and an interface to that hardware, like the NES or the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, and that is the platform when you talk about it. It's the Nintendo Entertainment System, it's these two layers. Uh, some actually include the operating system as well, so something like the PlayStation 4. Um, the PlayStation 4, the PlayStation, um, the Xbox, they all have embedded operating systems, but no one refers to the Xbox operating system when they talk about the Xbox as a platform. They just say the Xbox, and you're supposed to understand what that means. 
Um, other platforms are just the operating system, in this case Windows, like you say something runs on Windows, you don't talk about the specific PC underlying Windows that it ran on, it just runs on Windows. Um, and then you also have other soft, other uh, you know, platforms like the web browser, right? If you have a game that's written in JavaScript and HTML, all it needs to know is that it's executing in a web browser, it doesn't need to know that it's on a Mac, it doesn't need to know that it's on Linux, it doesn't need to know anything else. Um, and so we get into this kind of category problem of what we consider a platform and how we label these things. Um, and this also becomes a problem just due to the sheer number of these things. Um, so this list is just uh, what we would consider like mostly game-centric consoles that have been released over the past 40 years, which is over 400. Um, and the notion about this list is that there's no operating systems on it, um, and there's no international or divergent versions of any of these systems on it either. If you include all of those, you get way into the thousands very quickly. Um, and we realized that it was kind of incredibly difficult to deal with this specialized knowledge you need to you know, get this down into a single list. Um, the other problem with defining platforms is if you say that a platform is anything that a game ran on, then you're essentially talking about every computational device ever created by man. Um, I mean, even the early you know, computers that were blue sized in the 50s, someone made tic-tac-toe for that, you know, because it was just something to do. Um, and this becomes kind of funny in certain contexts for, you know, there's famous games like Myst, Doom, and Super Mario that were released all over the place. But in this case, all of these games are running on a graphing calculator um, because there's an active development community for making games on graphing calculators. This is a programming tech exercise and technical challenge. And so, does this go on our list of game platforms? Because obviously there's a lot of games for it, and some of them are copies of seminal games. But like that, this this all becomes just way too complex for any single institution to seem like it wants to deal with. And you have to decide if you actually even think that this is a valid definition of a platform for a game. Um, okay, so diving out of the complexity is a vocabulary. I'm going to talk about software citation for a little bit, and then at pretty much the end. Um, okay, so software citation. Um, we're looking for a standard for, for game software citation and academic works, and then we're also looking for, a, looking for a way to use that citation information to potentially link to data stored in an online repository at an institution that, that you could then load into an emulated system. Um, for the work that we've done on this, the project is actually a three-year project, and the third year is this, and that's this year. So we don't have too much actually figured out in this aspect yet, but I can show you um, a specific example from a specific scholar for a solution for a specific game, just to show you how complex, how complex it gets for game software citation. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about link citation and the needs for that, um, and close this out. Uh, there's a game, a book that was released uh, last year called I Am Error um, by Nathan Altus, um, which is a full technical and kind of social history, well, more technical, but with some, some social history of the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, and he, you know, did a lot of work in this. Um, and essentially revealed that if you're thinking about the Nintendo Entertainment System, which is a single platform, um, there's also the notion that since it existed for a decade and it needed to adapt to market competitions with other systems, they actually added um, extra processors and graphical capabilities into the physical cartridges themselves. So you have the same platform, but any cartridge actually added capability. Um, and as a result of that, if you're reproducing these things in emulation, or you want to actually be like very specific about what you're talking about, you not only need to reference the platform itself, but also the version of the cartridge that you put in, um, and the capabilities of that cartridge. Um, and the other notion here is that all of the work that he did for this came from the emulation community um, for the Nintendo. Like all of his base primary source research is just people who are interested in preserving Nintendo and he consolidated it into a book. Um, and he proposed two guidelines for physical citation if you have the actual game, um, and emulation citation if you ran the game in an emulator. Uh, and they're really scary looking. Um, in that, for, from his perspective as an expert in just this one system, this is the information that he would like to see um, if he was communicating what he was messing with to other scholars. Now, I don't expect you to go through this and understand any, like, all of what it's saying or anything that it's saying um, due to the vagaries of NES design. Um, but you know, this is what Super Mario Brothers looks like as a reference to you know, this specific, in this specific case, um, or like the idealized. Um, and then emulation isn't really much better. 
Um, you have essentially the emulation that you used, the file that it was, and then a you know all the header information and the emulator that you ran it on. Um, and this is pretty good in that the goal here is to cite it in a way that if someone else gets this file that's that size with those initial bits in the header and runs it on that specific emulator, you'll have the same experience as the person who was citing it. Um, but again, this is a incredibly complex you know, technical task to undertake, and this is one person who spent you know, his entire four years of dissertation research to kind of come up with a way to talk about the NES and specifically you know, his subset of game culture, and there are thousands of systems. Um, another aspect of our project resolving this kind of software citation issue is attempting to create ways to link <laughs> um, organized citation information about games to data that's stored in archival repositories and then getting you know, our good old virtual context back and putting it back on the web page, which is essentially making the Internet Archive, Internet Arcade type of thing you know, citable um, for an inter inter-institutional context. Um, and I can kind of show one quick example of that at the end, since I'm actually at good time. Um, but that's where I'm going to leave off with the kind of projects that we've been working on. Um, and I'm just going to basically wrap up in that the issues related to preservation of these <coughs> objects are only getting more complex um, as everything gets networked. Um, essentially, what you're going to need to do eventually is have highly parallelized, complex applications simulating other highly parallelized complex applications, um, and you start to get into these interesting exponential curves of the fact that our computers are getting exponentially more complex, and so if you're going to catch up to simulating them or emulating them, you have to be following this curve. Um, another notion is that since everything is becoming more networked, you have to decide like which sections of these networked objects you're actually going to preserve and save, and then if that's enough to actually rerun them or reproduce them in the future. Um, another big area is what to do with streaming applications and mobile applications, or basically things that are distri distributed over the network only and that you never have a physical copy access to. Um, one thing that we tried with the Game Citation Project for a little bit was to talk to people who actually do digital distribution and convince them to help out with some preservation aspects and that they could you know, distribute to us with the correct metadata that we're asking for from them just so that we can kind of get some sort of dialogue going with these large-scale, you know, online walled gardens that are incredibly antithetical to any archival activity at this point. Um, and then the last thing I always want to mention is that most of the technical work that allows us to do the emulation, especially for games, has been done by fan communities based on their own interest, in many cases without any sort of legal coverage. Um, and that Going forward, especially with the network type of games, the only way you'll actually be able to play some of these in the future if nothing changes is you will need to illegally crack and break them so that you can actually get access to them without getting network authentication. Um, okay, uh, so I'd like to thank the Institute for Museum and Library Services, the National Endowment for the Humanities, UC Santa Cruz University Library, and Stanford University Libraries for the initially financial support and then just you know letting me do this stuff. Um, and I'm again Eric Kaltman uh, from the Games and Playable Media Group at UC Santa Cruz. And then here I will bring these back up in a second. Um, I just want to see if this will work. So the, the okay, good, it is working. So yeah, just some sort of work we're doing right here. There's no audio, um, but. When we decided to get into figuring out how to describe things for citation and active you know, emulation in browser, um, these three emulators are a Super Nintendo, a Nintendo, and an MS-DOS machine that are all running in browser at speed without too much of an issue. Um, and in some cases, we just found people who had already done a translation from the C to JavaScript but hadn't actually finished the work. Um, and so what we're working on right now is essentially finding a way to let you run this game and then save the game or save the game as it's running and then store that saved material in a database that you can then retrieve later, um, which will essentially let you cite not just the software object but a specific point in the running piece of software. So if you want to talk about a specific level or section of Legend of Zelda, you can click on a link and it will load the game 
at that specific point, and then you can play from there. Um, and there's a lot of other cool things that you can kind of do if you have the ability to just drop tons of emulators um, into specific contexts. If this wants to work, yeah. Um, I'm going to reload that because this always has a little thing. Yeah, whatever, we'll just do this. So the thing that's kind of hilarious here, if you notice, these are a Japanese and an American game. Um, the bottom is the game Yonoid, which is a commercial game released to promote Domino's Pizza. Um, and the top is um, Kamen no Ninja, which is just a Japanese game. But the thing that's interesting is that whoever decided to make the Yonoid game essentially just copied the entire Japanese game um, and changed all the graphics. Um, and if you actually run both emulators at the same time, and I get this kind of going, do it, come on, start page. There we go. Um, so in this sense, you're basically, <laughs> you can play the same game written made for two different places, and you can just see that they're absolutely identical um, in that both input streams work. Um, and for my research and such, I'm actually kind of really interested in what you can do when you have access to, you know, the ability to compare multiple running types of systems and types of games in the same place and manipulate them within the same context. Um, and that's just kind of nifty stuff that we're working on for the end of this project. Um, I'll leave up the, uh, here we go, just the basic links to ooh, go all the way to the end. It's be fun trip through this entire talk. <laughs> um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, I can answer them while I'm just letting this go. Uh, because there's plenty to talk about still. Are there any questions for... Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, like, oh, if you play this controller, you'll be able to shoot four times as fast as you can Or, I never have to go into the console, but no one's on the ass. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I have to selectively leave out. The issue with, there's a big issue with that, in that there's a ton of peripherals and custom, you know, hardware components that are intricate to some games, and there's not a general solution for, you know, you have to collect all of those, and then I guess run them through the original systems, or create interfaces for these things for a new computer to play them. Um, in some cases, people actually now make Nintendo controllers that have a USB output, so you can play the Nintendo on your laptop with the original controller, um, if that's important to you. Um, but there's a whole unvast like, collection of peripherals um, and alternate inter input devices that hasn't really been looked into either. There are records for specific systems, but dealing with that is not something that we considered in scope yet, because we just you know, can only take up as much of this as we can chew at a time. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering about um, the method of, of, of the game, like say you have Super Mario and you want to, I guess you have already have a system where you have the credits, right, the, the, the developers and everyone involved. Mm -hmm. How does that work if you also include versions? Um, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so he's basically asking if you have metadata for a specific game that was developed by a specific set of people, um, how do you deal with software versioning? Um, in that metadata schema. Um, we don't really have a specific answer for that right now. Um, you have essentially uh, to find a way to record how the experience changed and whether or not it's worthwhile to record the different versions of the software or if there's specific seminal versions that were more important. You just kind of include those, note the version of the software, and move on. Um, that's also essentially another like, large research topic that hasn't really been addressed yet. Um, and that's kind of what happens whenever I am talking through this and we get questions, that like, a lot of the problems with preserving these objects and dealing with the metadata and the technical metadata concerns haven't really been looked into yet. Um, and when you do look into them, they get staggeringly complex really quickly. Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, can you maybe speak a little bit to your experience of working with these uh, fan communities from an institutional uh, perspective? like like. Has that been part of the work, and, and how uh, did that collaboration come about? Um, so the collaboration really hasn't happened too much yet. A lot of the, the, work, the, the work that we do to just 
do the research ends up coming from fan sites, but we don't have a lot of ties into that community immediately to get the information. That's one of the reasons in the conclusion I talked about wanting to actually make that a lot much more explicit in that there are people doing a significant amount of preservation work and even descriptive metadata and um, you know checksums and hashing for their own collections that are probably pretty applicable to institutional settings. We just have to find a way to translate them and bring them into the fold. Um, the next project that we're kind of working on is a sequel to GameStip, if we actually receive funding for it. Um, it's essentially going to try and answer some of the questions related to metadata for emulated systems. Like if you have an emulated system, how do you actually want to describe that so that you can get the data out of a repository and deliver it to an end user? Um, and also trying to get much more <coughs> communication going between the people in the game community who know, or the people in the online community of game preservationists, I guess, who know a lot about this information and can see the value in interacting with um, institutionals, institutional entities. Um, there is a bit of a hesitancy there because a lot of the people who are doing a lot of this work come from like hacker alternative cultures and so you coming in as some large institution saying that you know you want to help out develops some immediate allergic reaction sometimes. Um, so it needs to be like made explicit how there are advantages to interacting with you know long-term preservation institutions that can actually keep things around longer than you know you can host your own website while you've got the money. Um, is the research that you encounter with your Stanford archive more um, from an IT historical perspective or more cultural, her cultural heritage perspective? Um, the specific, oh sorry, yes. Um, I had to use the um, She was asking whether the, the work and research we do with the Stanford collection is more of a um, IT um, history perspective or a social history perspective, I think that you're asking. Yeah. Um, the collection, I guess, has the ability to study both. Um, I'm interested in how the technical history of games, you know, is embedded in the social history of actually doing the engineering and the technical work. Um, but due to the amount of, I guess, ephemera and other game magazines and content and packaging that's in these collections, you could very easily use them for social histories of games um, or do some more technical infrastructural work. But they would be available for both, at least for the collections that I'm familiar with. Apparently it doesn't happen yet. No, not too much. We have people for the Moret, for the Cabernet collection. A lot of people actually come to us just to look at box art and how the games are portrayed in packaging and then some things in like fan magazines and that, so it's a little bit more of a social history event. Um, I think the technical history stuff will come out a lot more to the fore once all of the imaging of the entire collection is done, and there's some way to access it internally at Stanford. Because then you'll have, you know, a collection of 15,000 games that, if we at all solve some of the emulation problems, we'll be able to come to that institution at least and, like, you know, play with them. Is there one more question? Mm -hmm. How do you stay uh, optimistic given all the challenges and the <laughs> of uh, problems and, uh, well, the pro prospect of uh, getting more complex? Um, I don't know if I am more optimistic about solving the problems or just it's nice to always have problems to be solving. <laughs> um, in that you're never going to really run out with this whole area. Like, it just keeps and you, know, you just like investigate it for a little while and it's like oh this whole technical thing I didn't even consider or know about is now an issue. Um, but I just think it should be happening. Like there are these games um, and interactive you know applications in general are like how we're mediating our existence nowadays, um, a lot of people. Um, and you know, the most, like most time spent on people's phones is playing games, everyone's kind of interacting with these things, and we want to preserve at least some of that somehow. Um, so I think doing whatever we can is better than, you know, not attempting to do it. Um, optimism is an interesting <laughs> perspective on that. Um, but I guess if you do stuff in archives, you always realize that you can't ever save any, everything anyway. Um, and so there's just this indefinite uh, yeah, awareness. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you so much um, for listening to my rant. And uh, if you want to chat afterwards or read more links to things, I have that. So, you know, feel free. Thank you.
three, four o'clock at night, um, jet lagged and all, and um, I, I just think it's been so informative hanging out with you these last two days. And uh, I have some um, Dutch produce for you and some branded produce. Uh, <laughs> I hope it gets to customs. Okay. I'll try. Um, oh, thank but uh, thank you so much for coming out and um, uh, giving me a lot of hand. So um, we're going to change laptops and switch gears a little bit. Can I unplug this? So uh, as promised, we want to, Bobo and Halika Pars and myself, we want to give you a few snapshots on why do we do this. To give you a sense, sort of in a very general sense, we're only going to take like 20 minutes. Uh, we want to have drink, drinks with you afterwards, so we don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but we think uh, it's, it's a really fun uh, collection as well, and the challenges are uh, numerous. And over the next year, I'll be doing, we'll be doing research with a team of people. To, uh, to figure out some ways to cope with these challenges, very experimental, sort of small scale. It's not like we're going to do thousands of games this year, unfortunately, but we'll start with a, a couple dozen. Um, but just to show you some examples of what, what, is, what is the Dutch game industry, and uh, I hope here and there some of you are depending on your age, you will probably recognize different things. So, um, yeah, let me kick off. Thanks. Um, so, um, also, actually, let me mention Femke. Femke is an intern. Uh, she is uh, going to do research into the early history of uh, games in the Netherlands. So, hopefully, uh, we can organize another meeting like this in a few months' time, or uh, maybe in another setting, but uh, and tell you a lot more about the history of Dutch games. Um, but for now, some snapshots. So, where does it begin? Um, it's kind of hard to say. I'm just going to show you some footage from our archive, because we are, of course, an audiovisual archive. Oh, actually, I should play in the sound. Um, sorry about that. So the earliest Dutch games, sorry? Yeah. So these are kind of cheese that needs to eat all the small dots. Um, so probably the first games in the Netherlands, um, <coughs> maybe apart from some obscure games that we haven't been able to retrieve yet, but um, are arcade games. Now arcade games, there were never any arcade games produced in the Netherlands, but arcade pools were quite a trend in the late 70s, early 80s. And this uh, Pac-Man uh, version is from, uh, um, I think around, uh, is it? 83, yeah, thanks. Um, and um, but, uh, so uh, in our collection, I don't think you're going to find arcade games, although we, we love that stuff, especially both here. Um, and we've done a retro game experience, and of course, it's, it's one big story. Uh, but to tell you a little bit about where we feel uh, Dutch games begin, it starts with what they called with the ability to play games at home. And then you can play in a very different form all these spells also play. The future will be that you and I, as we now, for example, have a house computer, a sort of tabletop computer, as here, where we have the low start. This is in the first instance for, for example, the opening of the game. You can have a game as you need to play in your house. If you look at the back, there is also a game like this. In the cassette or in floppy disks, this sort of games. And there we are. Um, so this is uh, a TV show from uh, 1981 in which they deal with um, different uh, technological innovation. And um, for those who didn't understand the Dutch, he was talking about the tabletop computer, which is really going to be the future. Actually, the part that I skipped talks about how you can look up prices for butter and lettuce. Uh, very <laughs> practical, but also, you can play games. There we go. Um, so we, uh, as you might have seen in the news or in a, a newspaper or something, we uh, got a collection of games from Radar Stuff, which is, I think, probably the first commercial 
uh, Dutch um, uh, game producer. And um, it's founded by Kees Kramer and Edwin Neutboom, who you can see here in the picture, and then there's John van der Aert, who's kind of a legend. And there was a real driving force behind um, their business called Nardo ja uh, Jacobs. Jacobs. And um, they made uh, the earliest Dutch games. You can see some examples here, mostly Commodore 64, but also some MX MSX and uh, the uh, um, odd CDI um, game. Um, their most popular game was uh, Angelos, or Endless, and it was, um, I'll mute this because it's quite an annoying sound, <laughs> but also really fun. Um, this game was um, uh, uh, brought out in 85, and it's, it's one of the first internationally known games in which they uh, did smooth scrolling. Um, so as you can see, there's no sort of lines if you scroll to the next screen and you sort of smoothly go to the next screen. Um, the game was really popular. In two weeks' time, it sold 15,000 copies. It was distributed in, uh, in at least the UK and Germany, but I believe also uh, France and some other countries. Um, so it's a really uh, exciting uh, little game, and it's one that we will have in our archives. Um, so that's really exciting. These types of games, they were produced in sometimes as little as two weeks, three weeks' time. A uh, small team of people, sometimes even just one person. I mean, the, 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 the limitations of the, the hardware that they were using, uh, uh, 64K and uh, memory and uh, all kinds of other limitations, uh, you had to be really creative within those limitations, um, but you could produce any number of games in a, in a year, so the production was quite high. Um, who knows who this guy is? If you have children a certain age, you should know. Yeah. 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 This is uh, one of uh, the, the, the biggest Dutch uh, Let's Play video makers. So he runs you through uh, Minecraft, and uh, hundreds of thousands of kids watch this every day. Um, so it seems a bit bizarre, but I think I found in our archive the very first Let's Play video maker. Here he is. His name is Arjan, and this is also a Raider Soft game called Topography uh, Build. And there we are, the very first Let's Play video of the Netherlands, I'm guessing. So even at that time, this was quite spectacular. People were very fascinated by uh, games, this developing new technology, and you could actually watch TV shows in which people were simply watching people play games. And this game actually goes on for like 15 minutes. I'm not kidding. Uh, so I'll end it here. Uh, this, by the way, is Enzo Bay. It's all in the game. And also pretty soon, uh, because of the popularity and uh, these uh, games becoming more prominent in our society, there was debates, like, how do these relate to things like violence, there were uh, oh, like 300 Nazi games uh, taken off the, uh, out of rotate, uh, what do you call that in English? Or, um, they, were, they were distributed by different people, but they were not allowed to be distributed anymore. Um, and um, this guy is making some comments about addiction to video games. Verslaving wordt vaak genoemd, bestaat dat? Dat niet op video spelen. Ik bedoel, wat is verslaving? Ja, ik vind eigenlijk verslaving toch een verkeerde betiteling. Je denkt dan toch aan heel wat anders. Als ik denk aan alcoholverslaving, dat heeft nog hele andere gevolgen voor mensen. Daar worden ze ook lichamelijk ziek van, geestelijk ziek van. Uh, er zullen al licht, er zullen wel eens lui zijn die al hun geld aan, aan videospelen besteden. Maar als die er niet waren, dan zou het ook weer wat anders zijn. Ik bedoel, als er dan een rage is van iets anders dan een steek. Basically he's saying, there's very little uh, chance that you get addicted to video games. I'm really thinking about other stuff. Well, by now I think we realize that this indeed was a big issue. Uh, it was already seen at the time. And I think in many ways games, um, um, are not a sort of a self-contained thing, but they relate to all kinds of things that are happening in society. And again, that shows their cultural and social value. Another example of this is, again, a rather sort of game. Of course, we're going to promote this collection a little bit because, uh, um, yeah, we're excited about having it. So this is a really fun one. It's called uh, Hollanditis. Hollanditis was a, a term coined by, uh, I have to look this up, of course, uh, an American historian, Walter Lacker. Um, in the early 80s, there was a lot of resistance against uh, nuclear <coughs> weapons being placed in the Netherlands, so a lot of uh, sort of pacifists protest against that. And this game actually uh, is a sort of a fun 
mocking of that situation. Um, it's about a guy called, and I'm quoting from the, from the, the packaging, Heinrich Glühwein, who's a, a 58-year-old detective from Basel, Switzerland, who is neutral to the bone, and hired to engage in the Hollanditis adventure. There are 1,000 hours left before the nuclear missiles will be placed. You have uh, a certain number of cigarettes, some booze, and basically you're good to go, and it's up to you to figure out how many missiles are going to be placed, or if you're going to uh, not at all. The last thing I want to talk quickly about this um, example is how are these games distributed? Um, this is a, a magazine called MSX Magazine, and um, it wrote, yeah, it was uh, uh, published around, uh, I think this one is from 85, but it went into the early 90s, I believe. Um, and they would um, uh, distribute listings. Um, listings were ways to distribute software, bits of software. So basically, they also distributed games. People could send in their own games, they would do a little contest, uh, sending a game, and people would simply be at home and type this into their own system, which would take you a few hours sometimes. Uh, and if you made a mistake, that could mean either the game wouldn't work, or it would do something completely different <laughs> than it's, uh, it was supposed to do. Um, but a, a fun way of distributing. And then, very interesting, point E of the um, regulations, the conditions for, the, for participating in the contest, is that the copyright to the programs that are sent to M6 Magazine fall to M6 Magazine itself, who then publish it into the public domain. People like me who like open content are very excited about that, but also, isn't that interesting how so early on it was a sort of um, an open source code um, before the fact. It was uh, basically a way to engage people with your code and get people to give feedback to that. So here we look at um, letters that were sent into the Magazine, magazine, where they basically say, if you change those lines for this bit of code, it works much better. Or if you... Um, there's a mistake in the code, or all kinds of ways in which people would uh, sort of form a community around certain uh, bits of software and try to improve these. Now, and finally, again, relating it to our own archive, it's not like we don't have anything related to, uh, to data and early uh, uh, information technology. This is, um, uh, oh, actually, I'm going to let you listen to it, see if you can tell me who it is, or what it is. Any thoughts? It's a program for set. Sorry? It's a program for set. Yeah, that's right. This is a bit of software being transmitted through radio. It's a program called Hobby Scope. And um, each day, or not each day, each week, I think it was, they would um, distribute a radio program. They would start with a sort of iconic, um, this program is um, probably not 50, like 35K. And it will start in three two, one, the person would be quiet and you would hear about three to four minutes of noise. And if you would record <coughs> the noise in your cassette and you would play it into, in your computer, it was basic code. The basic code was an, uh, a coding language that would work on several systems. Um, and um, I think, again, we, I love these sort of echoes of our present time with online distribution and that kind of thing in our past. Um, and also it was a Dutch invention. It was a Philips engineer who developed basic code, which was uh, concise enough and worked with simple systems, and was therefore, uh, it could work, was functional for these type of applications. So over to Popo, who's gonna uh, share a few more recent things. Hello. CDI stands for Contact Disc Interactive. It's an interactive multimedia CD player uh, developed by the Dutch company uh, Philips. Uh, it was created to provide more functionality than an audio CD player or game console, but at a lower price than a personal computer with a CD ROM drive. Uh, the first field CDI player was released in 1991 and priced around 700 gulden. As seen as a game console, the CDI format proved to be a commercial failure. Uh, the device was sold until 1998, and the company lost nearly one billion dollars on the entire project. Uh, the failure of the CDI caused Philips to leave the game industry after the system was uh, discontinued, 
and the system was most famous for its bad Nintendo titles. It was the first and the last time that Nintendo licensed their software to another uh, company. <laughs> and uh, let's see what the angry video game nerd, a uh, famous retro game worker, has to say about uh, this system. Let's talk about the Philips CDI. Now, if you're not familiar with the backstory, I'll give you a quick little rundown. Nintendo was working in conjunction with Philips to produce a CD-based add-on for the Super NES, which never came through. Now, Nintendo was also working with Sony on the same concept, and we all know what came of that, the PlayStation. But as for Philips, they too made their own game console. However, they had permission to utilize some of the Nintendo franchises. Now, what came of that was a shitty Mario game and three shitty Zelda games. <laughs> Link, The Faces of Evil, Zelda's Adventure, and Zelda, The Wand of Gamelon. <laughs> These games are notorious for their legendary ass suckage, which is hard to believe. How could there exist a bad Zelda game, let alone three of them, and on a console that's not Nintendo? Well, if you haven't heard of them, you might think you're living under a rock, but let me tell you, it's a rock worth living under. <laughs> okay. I'm familiar with the backstory, I'll give you a quick... The second title we're going to talk about is uh, Jazz Jack Rabbit. Uh, technically, this isn't really a Dutch game, but uh, the main code is a Dutchman called uh, Iron Gousset, who uh, later became the co-founder of Guerrilla Games, uh, which, we, which we will talk about later. Uh, Jazz Jack Rabbit is the uh, PC world's answer to uh, Sonic the Hedgehog from Sega. Uh, in its platform game, a rabbit called Jazz wants to rescue the princess and defeat an evil, evil turtle. Kind of the same like uh, Mario. Uh, it was released by Epic Games in 1994 and uh, turned out to be a fairly good high place game for its time. Uh, later, two PC <coughs> games and a handheld game followed, and it was also the mascot of Epic Games. Uh, now, I think you know this one. It's an A2 Razor. It's from Darklex Games. Uh, Darklex Games was a video game developer and publisher. It was located in Houghton. Um, the company was founded in 1997 and was most known for its uh, Razor franchise. Um, with the games Modern Razor and Modern Razor 2, selling over 600,000 copies in the UK alone. Um, the series started in 1997 with the A2 Racer. Um, in this game, the player has to race over the Dodge A2 highway. <laughs> in all the sequels, the racing extended to other places in the Netherlands and later in Europe. Uh, the game was, wasn't critically acclaimed, but has uh, quite a large cult following in the Netherlands, and mostly due to its uh, location. Seven. Yeah, it looked really basic. Next. Okay, um, this is a very famous uh, Dutch franchise. It's called Killzone. It's a first and third person shooter. It's uh, exclusively for the Sony platforms. Uh, first person means that you uh, see the game from the eyes of the character, and third person means that you see it from the back of the character. Uh, the games are developed by Guerrilla Games, uh, which was co founded by Iron Busset, which I told you about before. Uh, Real Games is based in Amsterdam and owned by Sony, and they currently employ about 270 people. Uh, Killzone currently consists of six games spanning over the PlayStation 2, PlayStation Portable, PlayStation 3, PlayStation Vita, and the PlayStation 4. Uh, the series began on the PlayStation 2 in 2004. It's most known for its uh, beautiful graphics, and it was supposed to be Sony's answer to the popular Microsoft Halo franchise. Uh, let's take a look how this game looks. This is from 2014. It was a launch title for the Sony PlayStation 4. Yes. 
questions of a few of them. So any questions? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I hope we uh, managed to warm you to uh, the idea of this institution also becoming involved with uh, game preservation. Um, and uh, again, I really want to thank Eric uh, for his uh, for him being with us. Um, we now have drinks and bar downstairs, and please come to talk with us. Um, if you have any questions, we'd love to. Uh, to Hear your thoughts and your perspective of what brought you here. Um, so please uh, follow the crowd, I think uh, you'll find your way there. Thank you very much for coming out today and uh, well, who knows what we're going